Today, we're going to talk about how to sample switches, how to break apart feel and sound, how to understand what it is that we like, what it is that we don't like, and to learn to describe what it is that we're feeling and hearing. Part of the joy of keyboards is the diversity of sound and feel, and switches are, in a sense, the heart and soul of your keyboard. But what we don't need to do is gamble, buy something that kind of looks good, and then end up not liking it that much. That's the goal today, help you discover things that you're really likely to enjoy and avoid stuff that you're really likely going to dislike. Now, comparison is absolutely essential to developing your sense of taste. It's a game-changing experience for someone trying to discover their best switch. But before we begin, I should disclose one important way in which I am biased. I help run a try before you buy program for switches. My affiliation with this program shouldn't cloud the overall importance of comparison, but it's still important for you to know. Now, a good question to ask is why compare in real life? And the reason for that is that switches are an extremely tactile experience. Usually when you buy things online, what you see is what you get. With switches, it's weird because it's incredibly hard to convey feel and sound online. So what you'll commonly hear as a result is to experiment. And when you do an experiment, it's like you have a hypothesis, right? With a bunch of switches in front of you, you can test multiple hypotheses and run multiple experiments simultaneously. We can find concrete answers to abstract questions incredibly quickly when they're right at your fingertips. And what's even cooler is that when we're comparing them in person, we're asking all these questions unconsciously. Normally, when you research switches online, uh, you have to be super explicit about all these questions. Do I prefer linear or tactile? Do I prefer a rounded tactility or sharper tactility? What's the difference in feel between a 52 gram bottom out and a 63 gram bottom out? And then you have to read all these comments and watch all these videos, but with multiple reference points right in front of you, you'll discover the answers to these questions incredibly quickly. So what we're essentially doing here is fast tracking the whole experimentation process. This way you should come to conclusions of what you like and what you don't like much quicker and perhaps more importantly, uh, much more accurately than before. Here, I've got 10 different switches mounted on these switch testers, but really two is enough, although the more you have, the better. What I recommend you to do is find some friends with different keyboards with different switches in them and then just get together and compare. Or if there's one happening near you, you could go to a keyboard meetup where you can type and talk to different people about their experiences. There are also switch testers like these, but I am a little hesitant to recommend them because they only have one switch per key so you can only press one switch at a time. Unless you type like this, it's hard to get a representative feel of what it'd be like to use any given switch on a day-to-day -day basis. So we redesigned these switch testers. These have multiple of any given switch for a more accurate typing experience. This way you can run more fingers on any given switch option. I'll link in the description so you can try 10 switches yourself at home and compare for yourself. While you're there, the first link links to a PDF. This is to help us sort of take notes and record what it is that we like and what it is that we don't. So let's begin. So there are two terms to bear in mind when talking about travel distance. Total travel refers to the total distance that a key can be pressed down before it reaches the bottom. A normal travel distance would range between 3.7 and 4 millimeters, and there are switches with shorter travel, sometimes referred to as speed switches, are 3.5 millimeters and below. Pre-travel, on the other hand, refers to the distance between the key's resting position and the point at which the switch starts to actuate. Usually, this is about half the total travel. So if you like typing on a laptop, you might like a switch with a shorter travel, but if you really like the hardy depth, you'll probably prefer options with a full four millimeter total travel. Weight dictates how much force you will need to facilitate a keystroke. When you look at switch stats, you will frequently see two measurements. Uh, one is actuation force and one is bottom out force. Actuation force is how much force is needed to activate a key. 
and bottom out is how much force is needed to press all the way down. To tie this to the previous section on travel distance, the actuation force is tied to pre-travel and the bottom out is tied to total travel. If you prefer to bottom out, meaning you press harder than what is required to trigger a keystroke, then total travel and bottom out force are the more relevant measurements. But if you don't, pre-travel and actuation force are more relevant. When it comes to bottom out, this may be a more optional factor. The two sides of the spectrum are represented by silent switches and non-silent switches. Silent switches, due to the padding they use to eliminate sound, feel more pillowy, and on the other hand, bottoming out on some switches will feel like tapping on a piece of marble. But there are gradations between the two extremes. Depending on the type of plastic used, some are going to feel softer and some are going to feel more rigid. Now, this is all very abstract, and this is where having the switches in front of you can really concretize your preferences. I would just type for a little while, like stress test it a little, and see if you feel that a switch feels not substantial enough, meaning it's too light, or it's fatiguing you, meaning it's too heavy. When it comes to feel, we have to segment into the three major switch types, which are linear, tactile, and clicky. The main draw of linear switches is its smooth typing experience, but there are different characteristics of smoothness. One is this frictionless smoothness, sort of like skating on a freshly cleaned ice rink. And on the other hand, it's the sort of textured kind of smoothness. So it's going to feel more grainy. I think a pictorial sort of metaphor would be the clinical sharpness of a photo from a digital camera versus the sort of nostalgic look you get from a film camera. As I'm filming this video in 2023, the general preference is going to lean more towards the frictionless side of things, but this trend isn't some sort of ahistorical constant that we've always been striving for. I only mention it because there's always going to be some gravitational pull from the current meta. Personally, I never want to tell you what you're going to feel and what you're going to like when you type on something. To go back to the photo metaphor, photos from a digital camera can look great, Photos from a film camera can also look great, but what you prefer is always going to be a personal question. So if linear switches are all about the smoothness, then tactile switches are about the bump you feel as you press down. Broadly speaking, there are four types of tactile bumps. With capital D shaped bumps, it's all bump and there's no pre-travel. So the whole keystroke is a bump. When typing on these, it feels a bit like a light switch since it's so binary. With capital P shaped bumps, there's no pre-travel and you start off with a bump, but that bump only goes halfway or two thirds of the way through the stroke. And then after that, you have post bump travel. And then we have lowercase p tactility. I wrote this lowercase p in a bit of a weird way, but that's on purpose. That little tag on top, that is the pre-travel we talked about earlier. There is a lead-in at the top, and this bump goes out only about halfway or two-thirds of the way down the keystroke. Then, there's some post-bump travel before you hit the bottom out. With lower R-shaped bumps, you can think of this as the lighter version of the lower P-shaped bumps. There's a little bit of pre-travel, then a very small bump, and then a little bit of post-bump travel. People might describe this as a sandy sort of tactility, like there's a pebble stuck in your switch, even though this term sandy is usually used in a more pejorative sense. Now clicky switches are known for their crunchy feel, which to me always has reminded me of sort of stepping on autumn leaves. And there are two primary designs when it comes to clicky switches, the click jacket and the click bar. Click jackets feel more delicate than click bars, which feel more chunky and more substantial in comparison. Now the sound around switches is a bit of a thorny issue. Sound is the most complicated factor because switches only play a part in the overall sound profile when typing on your keyboard. So a switch's sound won't ever be constant. It's going to depend on context. But the thing is, it's not really this black box either. No matter what keyboard or keycaps you use the switches with, there's going to be some shared DNA. It's like a person with or without makeup will look different, but not unrecognizable. I would think of switches sound in the same way. Now there are two aspects to sound and that is pitch and volume. Pitch is basically this. How deep does it sound? Is it high pitched or is it low pitched? And then volume asks, is this loud or is this quiet? The thing about sound in switches is that a switch makes sound both when you press down and when you let go. So when talking about sound, 
we have to distinguish between the downstroke and the upstroke. Normal switches will make sound both on the way down and on the way up, and silent switches will make no noise both on the way down and on the way up. Semi-silent switches are more interesting. It only makes noise either on the way down or on the way back up. It's just one or the other. Now, there are some flaws in switches that should be pointed out. Here, I'll just talk about two that people talk about most. With spring ping, I'll let you listen to what it is first. This metallic sound is generally considered to be undesirable because it interferes with the otherwise clean sound profile you get when the stem collides with the housings. You might have also heard of the term stem wobble, and the main concern here is this thing called resting state wobble. If you have bad resting state wobble, then the lines on your keyboard aren't going to be perfectly straight. If wobble is really bad, when you let go of a key, the stem is going to slightly shift a little bit. So you're going to end up with jagged lines between your keycaps. Switches with tighter tolerances, so less stem wobble, won't have this issue. In general though, really bad wobble is not much of a thing, but it's still something to look out for. Now, the thing about these flaws is that you should think of them more as thresholds, not something to be absolutely minimized. This is not to excuse flaws, but it's more like, if you find yourself really liking a switch, but you find that it has a little bit of stem wobble, don't overthink it. So let's take the example of spring pain. And here, I got a beam spring keyboard. And these types of keyboards are really popular within a certain group. And let me tell you, you can't imagine the spring pain on these. If people can live with spring pain in one of these, then people can also live with spring ping in one of these. So even in terms of flaws, I can't tell you what you're going to find unbearable and what you're going to be relatively more okay with. So this is the difficulty with flaws. Different flaws are going to stick out more to different people. It's going to be your call at the end of the day. The typing experience is more than the sum of the things we just talked about. So descriptors are a nice way to encapsulate the overall typing experience on a Switch. Descriptors are nice if you want to discuss your summaries with others, or if you need a term or two to come back to at a later point. If one specific word pops up in the back of your brain, write it down, keep it, grab it. It's really useful when that happens, but don't feel you have to get super specific for every single thing. I'll throw up some popular terms up on the screen, and if you need more granular terms, I think mouthfeel terms are actually pretty good to use. So think of things like gummy or chewy. But the big two terms thrown around are thocky and clacky. Instead of giving you a word salad, I'll just put up some sound tests here so you can hear what each one sort of sounds like. With all that said, I tend to think the whole descriptor process can be a little wishy-washy. You know, very specific descriptors are probably intimidating to some people, frustrating to others, pretentious to others still. But on an individual level, I think it's still a pretty useful mental shortcut. And now it's time to provide a score. Now, I don't love scores too much when broadcasting them to a larger audience. Because even if you provide a super holistic view of a switch, um, if you cap it off with a score, that's all that we'll remember. And in any case, what you like is not what other people will like. But I think as you're trying them for yourself, just give it an emotional score. Here, I just want you to have a place to make a note of your favorites for things you liked and for things you didn't really care for and for everything in between. So go, go and compare and contrast take a bunch of notes, you're going to change your mind about how you feel several times in one sitting. That's totally normal. And in this video, I talk about how counterintuitively, switches are not a technological product, which shows how viewing them through a technological lens might actually lead you to making an uninformed purchase decision. So I hope this was a useful guide to help you navigate switches more easily, more enjoyably, and with less mistakes. But now, I want to hear from you down in the comments below. What did I miss out on? What more information would be useful to you when it comes to buying switches and feeling confident you're going to enjoy it? 
Should I have talked about certain aspects more in detail? Or what information do you find most useful when trying to find the best switch for you? Let me know down in the comments below. But for now, thank you so much for watching and I hope you have a nice day.